Hi, everyone, and welcome to our first uh, webinar of this series for the uh, BFOF Young Producer Webinars. Um, we're really excited this evening to welcome Adam and Marie Sher of Shaylin Farms. Um, just before we get started with them, uh, we'll just go over um, a few things before we get started, like we do uh, usually with these webinars. Um, just uh, to listen in, uh, only you can only hear me, we can't hear you, so if you have any questions, um, you should have uh, access to a little uh, side panel where you can type in your questions. Feel free to type those in, and as we get towards the end, um, we'll make sure that uh, we, uh, Adam and Marie, can uh, answer those questions for you. Um, and if you're having any other issues, just feel free to type those in, and we'll see if we can uh, figure those out for you there. Um, just as we move along a little further here, just to give you guys a, a bit more information. Um, we have done webinars for the past two years now, so if you're interested in any of those past webinars, you can find all of them on the BFO website. So if you go to OntarioBeef.com under Programs, you can find them there. So there's a whole bunch of different topics. We've done a lot of different interviews with other past producers, um, and whether it's cow-calf or feedlot, um, there's lots of different information there um, from different producers and how they've made their operations work. So feel free to check those out and uh, you can learn lots of different uh, ideas and topics uh, on those webinars. Um, we have lots of different young producer resources along with those webinars on our, our website there. So if you're looking for information on what might help you in getting your uh, operation started or moving it forward, uh, you can check that out there as well. Um, and that might uh, help you moving along. So feel free to check those out or um, you can find other information as well from myself or uh, Jacqueline Hornberg, who's also listening along with us here tonight. She's great for more information or um, uh, Dan Ferguson, who is, is our other producer relations uh, uh, specialist or manager um, who can help you with that along those lines. Um, for more information, you can find that on our website. As I was saying, you can sign up for our weekly e-newsletter, the bulletin board. Um, you can get our magazine. And as always, social media is a great place to go to find more information for these webinars or other great events that are coming up. Some of which um, this Saturday, one is coming up in Lambton County for um, a cover crop grazing field day to learn more about that. If you're interested in something along those lines, there's still time to register for that. You can find more information on our website um, or you can contact myself or Jacqueline as I was talking about there. Um, so that's an option. And another one that's coming up in December is Carcass 101. So if you're interested in learning more um, along those lines for information about Carcass and, uh, and uh, marketing information, uh, this is a great opportunity to uh, take part in. Um, with that, stay tuned for more details on uh, our December webinar coming up. Uh, those details will be coming soon. And uh, we'll uh, be definitely doing more in the new year as well. So. With that, I will uh, turn it over to our actual, what you guys signed up to here tonight, not just me. So I'm going to send it over to Adam. So Adam, turn you off your mute here. And sign there, and then. We'll do that, and we'll be away on the races. There's your webcam, and I'm just gonna make you the presenter here. There we go. Perfect. Oh yeah, look at all this extra stuff going on. All right. There we go. It's all you. Gonna memorize some more stuff. There we go. How's that look, everybody? Now I gotta see. Hide my webcam. All right. Okay, I think we're good to go. Um, yeah, we're pretty excited that uh, that Beth and Jacqueline and uh, I, I guess Dan as well uh, thought of us to uh, to give a little bit of a presentation on on uh, our family and our uh, beef operations. So um, I I was thinking how to introduce ourselves and. And uh, I think you're going to find by the end of our little talk here that uh, I don't think you'll think of us as too much of a special operation that we don't do a lot of uh, elite things. But uh, 
maybe the one take home message is that uh, I think we probably look and feel a lot like many of the cow calf beef operations in the rest of the province. I hope so. Uh, maybe you'll see something that we're doing or um, we'll make a new connection tonight and uh, I know hopefully hopefully we get something out of it and uh, hopefully we're entertaining enough that you also enjoy the presentation too. So. Um, with that being said, um, this is my wife Marie and my name is Adam and uh, we're part of Shayland Farms. Um, I suppose we've been going by that name since we were married how many years ago? Eight. But you have been using that for yeah. eight. So we've been using it for a number of years, uh, our farm name. Um, but uh, a little bit about our family is, would you say we were married eight years ago? Yeah. Okay, so time flies. And uh, we also just so happened to buy a farm eight years ago as well, uh, a few months after we got married. And we now have four uh, daughters, <laughs> uh, six, four, two, and three months old. And uh, we farm with my mom and dad and uh, my uncle as well. Um, but we're running separate farm businesses that we will talk about a little bit uh, later. Um, but that's kind of our family uh, in a nutshell. So it's growing fast in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> but as, you, as you'll as you notice on all the slides, the girls are fully involved in the day-to-day -day operation. And I think Marie and I really enjoy that aspect of it, that uh, the family gets to grow on the farm because we both experienced that too when we were younger. So um, a little bit about my background. So, uh, I was born in 1986, so I'm 32, so I'm a, I'm a generation uh, wire, I guess. Um, and uh, I have one sister, and like I said, we were always engaged on the farm growing up. And um, actually, when I was younger, my dad and grandfather were in the hog industry uh, with my uncle as well. And, uh, dad, and then also, when I was uh, a little bit older, dad finished cattle in a feedlot and then uh, ever since I was more actively involved on the farm we've morphed into a cow-calf operation uh, with with dad and Uncle Wayne uh, cash cropping as well. Um, so I, uh, I had an interest in, in politics uh, when I was in high school so I went away to Carleton University in Ottawa and uh, got a degree in political science and history so uh, I don't, as you'll find out, I don't really use that degree much in my day-to-day -day, uh, things now, but um, I was lucky enough to uh, to get a job um, in the ag industry. So uh, I, I do sales agronomy um, and those sorts of things uh, full-time off the farm. Um, so then that's why I think you'll soon find out that I do uh, very minimal amount of work. I'm kind of like the weekend warrior farmer and Marie's the one that does a lot of the work uh, day to day on the farm. Um, and so anyways, yeah, I uh, really, really appreciate being in agriculture um, as a farmer and in, in the egg industry as well. Um, and yeah, I, anyone that knows me personally knows I'm pretty passionate and excited about agriculture. So um, yeah, that's, I guess, enough about me. And then I was born and raised actually out in Indian River, which is just east of Peterborough, on a sheep farm. So very little uh, experience with cows. And when I married Adam, that's when I got introduced to the cows. And it didn't take long to become much more comfortable with them. I, when I first met him, I don't think he thought I'd ever go into the barn. <laughs> but that has quickly changed, and I do a lot more with the cows. Though I still have some sheep on the farm just to keep me happy. Yeah. So, yeah. And I actually, I also went to university and I got my Bachelor of Nursing and it, kind of like Adam, I don't actually use it any longer unless I'm, I guess, tending to my children, but that's about it. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, so you're going to go over this too. Okay, so on this, on the Shayland farming farm, there's been two generations working on it and with three parallel the businesses, as Adam has said. So. We have our cow-calf operation. Adam's mom has her cow-calf operation. And then Adam's dad and uncle have the cash crops. So 
with all three of those operations, we share equipment and labor. Uh, and we have, as Adam has mentioned before, we did buy this farm eight years ago, but it's in cash crops currently. So all of our barns and all of the animals are at the in-laws. So it's about five minutes down the road and we go there at least once a day to do that. So yeah, is there anything else you want to add to that? Uh, and your farmer's market thing too, that's your baby. Yes, I attend the farm, I attend in the summertime, three farmer's markets, two in Peterborough, one in Millbrook, and where we sell beef, lamb, pork, and rabbit. Obviously we only raise the beef and the uh, lamb, and then my mother provides us with the pork and the rabbit. So as at this current time, a very small amount of our beef goes through the farmer's market. Actually this nice lovely speckled park guy was sold through the farmer's market last year at a bit of a bigger size. <laughs> and um, But most of it we actually retail live as a weaned calf via Cookstown. Um, and I don't think we mentioned we have about a hundred sheep as well. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we would sell uh, uh, you know maybe 20 percent of them are sold through the farmers market channels and then the other the other uh, the rest of the lambs go to auction um, and that's how we market our, our calf crop as well um, we'll usually wean them in the fall and then they're sold as you know around the 600 pound mark um, at auction um, if, if we're not retaining them for replacements um, yeah so it's been an interesting journey because I think when we first got married we likely would have only had like half a dozen cows maybe so we've we went from probably around a six kind of cow operation um to i think we're going to be calving a little over 60 cows in march um yeah so it's it's definitely been uh, a huge growth curve for us that's for sure so the uh, a year for our cows is pretty typical, it kind of follows the same pattern every year. So October to February, um, all of the cows are together. Our, our cows are with Carol's cows and they're outside on um, an unused pasture where they're fed dry hay, corn silage, oatage and haylage. And about once a week um, at the end of December, we give them a day of either straw or poor feed just to extend our feeds. Um, we also, we do a pregnancy check of the whole herd uh, and the beginning of January, our vet absolutely loves us on that day because it always tends to be absolutely freezing cold in a terribly insulated barn. And uh, he's preg checking out over 100 cows. So uh, at preg checking time is also when we call our cows. Anything that's not bred is automatically called and anything shortbred, um, unless they're meant to be a summer calver, is also called. Last year when we had them preg checked, only one was open and four were shortbreads. So that was, we think, a pretty good. Um, and then March to May, they are in the feedlot, which is a cemented feedlot with barn access where they calve out. Um, we bed that up every day, normally about four bales of straw. And the summer or the spring calvers, uh, or the sorry, the summer calvers and the bulls are outside. So they're not in the feedlot with the other animals just to try and um, act, or utilize as much space as we have. Uh, and then June to October, they go out to different ranches. Adam and I rent three different ranches. Yeah, kind of almost four, I guess. Yeah, almost four ranches yeah. that they go to. And they have three different bulls at each ranch. So it makes it really easy um, for pedigrees because we know exactly which cow is being bred to which bull. So I guess before we go on, so um, we maybe we'll talk about it later, but we run we run two different herds right now in Marie's and I's herds, which gives us some problems sometimes. But we have a black cow herd and a red cow herd I, I, is the simplest way to explain it. Um, and so then we run two red bulls and one black bull. Um, and so we do have problems with the uniform calf crops and things like that. But um, uh, we'll maybe talk about that a little bit later um, and all of our pastures that we pastured cattle on in the summer are all rented so we do have limitations there as to what we can do on those pastures in terms of us um, making an investment and that sort of thing <coughs> one or two of the pastures that we have were actually either fallowed land for a number of years or um, or in cash crops, we tried to cash crop them for a year or two yeah. and realized that they would be much better suited to permanent pasture. So we've actually seeded down pasture 
brand new pasture and fenced on some of these rented grounds. Now we have kind of uh, long-term lease agreements on some of those properties, but I would say that's maybe unique in Ontario that in the last five, six years, we've actually uh, created more pasture rather than ripped it up. As okay. Since we're in East Central Ontario, we've, we've lost a lot of uh, beef cows. The beef cow herd uh, has been significantly reduced, probably 20, 25% in the last 10, 12 years, maybe I would say, especially post BSE, right? The, the reverberations of that was ongoing. Um, so it's, it's somewhat unique in our area to be adding new pasture into production, I would say. Um, so kind of more nuts and boltsy things here on the stored feed. Mostly uh, we're doing corn silage, dry hay, uh, oats wrapped, which we'll talk about later, or oats, bees, barley wrapped in tubes, um, which that would be if we're um, seeding down new hay, then we're using the oats, bees, barley as a nurse crop uh, a lot of years. We've also started wrapping some more hay as well, having a hay loop. Yeah, that's right. We don't have quite enough storage uh, for cattle and or or feed storage so then sometimes it actually makes more sense for us to wrap hay that's almost dry or even dry in some cases um, and so what happens with marie and i is we do an awful lot of equipment sharing and labor sharing to try and balance out things with the other operations that we're kind of working in parallel with um, so marie and i don't own all that much equipment as it stands today, but we are finally at that stage where we are investing in infrastructure. Um, so we've bought our we bought our first tractor last March um, and we're starting to buy some of the feeding equipment um, like feeder wagons and things like that. Um, but in terms of other other field work tractors and uh, disc vines and rakes and things like that, balers, um, all the ownership of that equipment sits with either mom or um, with uh, dad and Uncle Wayne. Um, we haven't uh, cut our own silage in, in a number of years um, never I since I was a teenager, I think, so it's been a while. So we just have a custom operation come in and cut corn silage. Uh, we're up to about 60 or 65 acres of corn silage for the entire herd, which if we would have 60 cows, I think mom is around 80 to 90 cows, so we're getting close to that 150 mark. Um, and we usually do one silage bag a year just because our 40 by 60 bunker that we poured two years ago isn't really big enough for those, for that amount of acres. Um, and the egg bag does give us some flexibility that we can feed that corn silage to some sheep or um, to cows as, as like a longer term stored uh, feed. Mm -hmm. um, so what something that's fairly unique that you, if you've ever heard us talk or heard me talk before, is um, that we've been grazing cover crops now for, this is our third year, yep. and we can't uh, speak high, even more highly, like it's just been phenomenal for us. Um, it's great. Um, so we work with a limited land base, as we talked about, because anything that can be cash cropped is generally cash cropped, mm -hmm. um, and then we're left with with more marginal land that's either in hay or pasture, um, that sort of thing. So we uh, formed kind of a, a relationship with a neighbor of mine by the name of Adam Bent. And when I was in 4-H, he was a, a beef leader of mine. And so he's known me since I was a kid, basically. And um, he just cash crops himself. But he also believes that there is a lot of benefit to having ground covered and biological activity in the fields by the way of manure. So then we came to this arrangement where we're actually planting a cover crop on his fields after winter wheat harvest comes off. Um, and then we fence it and we throw our cows out and graze it. And I've got some costing that we show um, here, but we're responsible for anything related to the cows. He just basically helps us plant the cover crop and then he says go to town There's the field. Mm -hmm. um, so these so these pictures of these cows grazing cover crops are all the fields that he owns um, And we trade off on on some of the different aspects of the arrangement, but we uh, Feel like it's very beneficial to the both of us. So that's kind of a fairly unique uh, thing in the industry, I believe. So that's why there's been many people interested in uh, interested in what we've been doing. 
So for fencing on the ranch, we just do one strand of high tensile around the perimeter, which is um, electrified. And then I use the turbo wire that you can see in that one picture of, with me with the baby uh, for creating paddocks. And so they're moved every couple of days via the turbo wire. This is our first actual year with snow cover on the cover crop. And so I've been surprised at how well the cows have done with the snow there. They're still grazing it right down and it's still lasting, each section still lasting quite a while, like the one or two days with them. Um, they seem to be enjoying it and they're, it's, yeah, it's quite uh, unbelievable actually, because I would have thought they would have turned up their noses. This picture on the right hand side was from, when was it last week? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we did have, you know, four, five inches of snow and minus 15 kind of temperatures where water was freezing and kind of thought, oh, we're going to pull these cows off. And, uh, but no, it's worked out really great. They just kept slugging away. Um, uh, so this is also the first year that we are not doing this with cow calf pairs because we weaned our calves for the first time coming off pasture this year so that we could have these cows <laughs> grazing later on the pasture than we ever had before because the limitations in the first two years is mm -hmm. we needed to get our calves marketed to auction um, in somewhere between the middle of October and the middle of November but yet we wanted to be grazing cover crops so uh, we decided to wean them this year and it's worked out uh, really really well. Mm -hmm. It's much nicer for moving the cows too because the cows come a lot quicker than the calves do. Yeah. So. So a little bit of nuts and bolts on this stuff. Um, this is from 2018 and uh, I'm a fairly big numbers person because I've heard lots of people talk at various meetings and, and things in the industry and I always say well that's a great idea on paper and you sound thrilled about it but show me the numbers. Does it actually, is it profitable or is this just an expensive hobby of yours and you just like being on a speaker? circuit sort of thing. Well, this is turning out to be a very successful venture, I think, for us. So I didn't like the idea of winter wheat stubble being uncovered for the fall into the winter, and neither did Adam Bent either. So this is where the idea came about, is we want the ground covered. But being the cash cropper that he is, he doesn't want to necessarily invest in cover crops and not necessarily see a return right away. Because if you know anything about soil health and soil structure, is it's a multi-year process to try and get those things improved. And so then he said, well, I want an immediate payback from my investment into a cover crop. So I said, well, we'll buy the seed, you sow it, we'll give you all the manure for free, and we'll even spread it for you, by the way. And so it, it's worked out really well. Um, so then what we've been doing here is is the numbers here, no-till August 16th last year after the wheat came off and we started grazing uh, October 15th. So that's about 50 to 60 days after planting. And that's, I think, what most people in the industry agree. That's maybe a good time. When we get talking about the species, you'll see maybe why. Um, and we finished November 8th because it was starting to get to be fairly poor weather and we, we were in a hurry. Home. Yeah, we needed calves home. So anyways, we only got 25 days grazing last year. Um, and I want to use this number for hay costs, eight cents a pound. So if you think of an 800 pound bale of dry hay, that's $64. I think we should be using that number. And I always included the five cent number because then someone said, well, I can produce it cheaper. If you think you can grow hay cheaper than that in certain areas of the province, maybe you can, but around here, mm, maybe not. So I've used this, this high number and uh, I figured we would have, saved money on hay costs. At the very least, last year was a bit of a break even. Um, but the good thing we don't, we like about here is we didn't, we didn't spread any of this manure or have to start any tractors when we were doing this, which is, is awesome. Yes, there's a significant amount of labor involved setting this up, but once it's set up, it's really nice. Um, so, uh, you can, if you maybe can tell that I, did this slide up. Marie said, why are you writing so many words on the slide? It looks ugly. And it is. <laughs> but if you want this amount of detail, then here it is. Um, and we can come back to this if anyone has any questions about this. But um, he's base here's basically what we were doing this year on what we have in our cover crop blend. 
So this is no-tilled into the wheat stubble by Adam and his no-till drill. Um, barley, oats, turnips, radish, and uh, hybrid brassica, which is a cross between, uh, I want to say, kale and turnips, but don't quote me on that. Um, in terms of costing, I thought, well, okay, we'll lay this out for everyone to see, and we don't really want to lie to ourselves in terms of what it actually is truly costing us. So he's agreed to no-till it, and I'm figuring that's going to cost him 25 bucks an acre. So if you were to do this on your own operation and it was your own winter wheat stubble, then you would need to incur that cost. But for us, we don't have to worry about that cost. So everything else is ours to own below. So the seed that we buy, um, he also went and spread some fertilizer on there um, around the 14th of September, I believe. Yeah, I think I got that wrote down over there. Um, and so then there was some other nutrients in that fertilizer blend, but we've agreed that Marie and I are only gonna pay for the nitrogen that was in that fertilizer. Uh, trucking them there and back again, because um, it is a fair bit down the road from yeah. us. And then labor, which would include like the setup of the fence and the tear down of the fence. And then also, um, like Marie said, it's just a single strand of high tensile wire around the perimeter and I step 15 paces out I put a really cheap t-post everything yeah. yeah cheapest I can buy with just one one plastic insulator on it um, and then if I spread those fencing costs out over 10 years because mm -hmm. we think we can reuse some of that stuff up to 10 years then I come out with the cost of 72 bucks an acre and so then this year because we had so many more cows grazing and Marie's saying that maybe we'll get out till the next Tuesday with these so. things. Yeah, I keep asking her when, when we're going to run out. Yeah, it's <laughs> and, hard to estimate. Yeah, yeah. And um, so anyways, I think we were going to save, you know, close to $6,000 in hay costs. Now, are we going to see that money in our pockets? Not likely. That's the no. problem with the farm. But um, I think it only cost us maybe $3,000 to do this this year sort of idea. So in my mind, that's fantastic. We don't have to worry about, you know, they, they might have, they might have ate 80, 90, 100 bales of hay in that time. Um, and so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, definitely there's labor involved in moving them every day. And yes. maybe you can talk about what you do when you, you've been moving them this year. Yes. So actually we, um, cha I changed the way that I moved the turbo wire um, this year. Normally I had been setting up a strand and then setting up a second strand behind it because the uh, fence wasn't so wide between so I could just use one turbo wire but this year at the beginning we had to use two turbo wires so I actually set up the turbo wire in a zigzaggy pattern which bothered me because it didn't look very pretty but it made it much easier to move it because then I just moved the V back and it and then otherwise I'd have to try and go and unhook the turbo wire and then restrand it but we didn't have enough turbo wire reels this year to be doing that. Um, and then I didn't have any escapee cows, and they all stayed in the right side of the fence. So, that, yeah, they actually worked pretty well. Yeah. So, in years previous, we had this uh, central watering system with mineral and salt here. Mm -hmm. And then these black lines were was where Marie was running the turbo wire. So, we were only giving them these, I call this the hub and spoke uh, kind of design. We were giving them two days in here, and then we would move them into this new paddock beside there and give them two days. Well, now what we're doing is we're not doing any back fencing. See, in this design, there's a back fence, so they can't go back and regraze. Um, but we're not doing any back fencing this year. All we're doing is Marie's just moving the turbo wire forward sure. like 10 or 12 feet every day. Because um, I figure, because it is just a cover crop, it doesn't matter if they back graze. During the summer when I'm doing pastures, I don't want them back grazing because that needs to regrow. Yeah. But for the cover crop, it doesn't need to regrow. For East Central Ontario, right where we are, this is a one and done proposition. There's not an opportunity to regrow graze if we're starting grazing on October 6th there's really no opportunity for regrowth after that some falls there might be like when we let them in there's a little bit of regrowth on yes. the first paddock but not much we'll let them back in there but yeah it's kind of a one and done kind of setup um, and you can see um, I don't know oh there's an example of the residue that we're leaving and uh, Adam will likely go in here no till this so no concerns about really leaving residues um, and causing us grief. In terms of uh, safety, in terms of feeding, bloating, um, nitrate poisoning risk, yeah. it's been awesome. They're, this is this is such a diversified mix that they're not going to overload on any single one. Um, you'll notice I crossed out crimson clover and two pounds of sunflower seeds. I didn't 
mention that, but I always do that just to remind myself, should talk about it. This mix has changed every single year since we started, and I keep fine tuning it to somewhere where I really like it. We backed off on the rates of the brassicas in here, um, and that's why our seed costs are way down from 40 down to 26 this year. And uh, I keep including a little bit of clover in hopes that it's going to do something awesome because I like the idea of nitrogen fixation for Adam for his cash cropping side of things, but clovers just don't get growing enough um, with this kind of mix. The sunflowers did really well, they but grew too. the yeah Not they yeah they grew yeah they grew no more than that yeah maybe a foot yeah and but the trouble was is the first frost that came along they were totally done mm -hmm. whereas all of these other things are very uh, cold tolerant and so they've seemed to have done really well so that's enough about grazing we can come back to that one if you folks have lots of questions for us I suppose yeah um so you want to talk about this lovely thing because you were so excited about how successful it was this year oh <laughs> so on our own farms or on randy's farm as well sometimes we quite often plant um oats after winter wheat and so the past we've done it for three years now and so in 2017 and 2018 it worked out really well we managed to cut it and we got quite a few bales per acre uh, this year, there is absolutely nothing out there. Well, there's something out there, but there's nothing to cut. So it's a complete failure this year. Um, and I think it's because we likely didn't spread any fertilizer on it, is what I'm thinking. Yeah, I think we, it was a little bit later planted this year because of the year. Um, and we and then rain. we yep. didn't get around to putting nitrogen on it. And I think that was what did us in. But uh, hey, it's still a cover crop. Yeah, so it's on so some really slopey ground, and it's great to have that ground covered. So erosion hopefully will be minimized for that. So for yeah. the cash crop side of the not our business, it will be really nice. Yeah. For Adam and I, it's just a bit of an expensive adventure. Yes, and so that's I suppose in in some of this cover crop business and emergency forages, if you want to call this oatage emergency forages. Yeah. Um, there's failures that happen sometimes. So. Um, I think we spent. I looked at. I think we spent over two thousand dollars on oat seed this year. That uh, we're out that because of that, and so uh, we also can't really put crop insurance on that either. So um, that I know of. So um, those are the risks and, and failures, I suppose, that, that, that we're going to go through. Um, but we've we've had some really good successes. Um, you know, we've been doing 50, 60 acres, so we've been picking up uh, quite a bit extra for us. So I, I really enjoyed that uh, so far. Oh, here we go. <laughs> ah, yes, this is my, yes, yes, yes. So work-life balance or lack of it. And some days it definitely feels like a lack of work-life balance. So we have four children under the age of six. Two of them are in school full-time, thankfully. So our uh, second eldest daughter is in JK and our eldest daughter, Madeline, is in grade one. And then our third daughter, Amelia, attends daycare two days a week. Now that daycare is an unlicensed daycare, ran out of a home uh, because we actually can't get into the licensed daycare. My two older girls were in the licensed daycare a couple of days a week, but because we're only looking for part-time care, we were, and what I called at the beginning of September, we're number 20 on the list. So that's not very promising. And I registered her over a year ago to try to get her in. So. I know in Durham County, they or they did, I don't know if they still do, they were running a program that you could get a college student to come and watch your children while you did chores for a couple of hours a day, and that was subsidized somehow, which would be fantastic, but that's not here. So how I managed to have four children and do a little bit of farming is lots and lots of grandparent support. That's where the three oldest ones are tonight, actually. And I took a very minimal maternity leave. So the girls come out to the barn with me all the time. And uh, most of the time they enjoy it, sometimes they don't. As you can tell in that one picture, poor Abigail, or poor Amelia has fallen asleep. We were out working during her nap time, so um, I couldn't put her into bed yet, so she's fallen asleep in the tractor seat with me, which isn't sadly uncommon. Yeah. So we don't pay, Marie doesn't pay into EI or anything, so there's absolutely no maternity leave for Marie. So her maternity leave on Abigail was uh, like, four weeks maybe, if that even. I was back in the barn for two weeks. Yeah, it was very fast. <laughs> so yeah, and anyways, uh, that is that is a, a, a challenge that we have to overcome on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Adam works, as you mentioned earlier, works full-time off the farm. And so then I attempt to 
we're, look after the cows and the sheep, which are the bane of Adam's existence, I think. <laughs> and then, as you can see, the girls are with me quite continuously. So the one picture there when I'm wearing the Charlet hat, that's of, I think that's actually Amelia in the carrier, and the carrier saves me a lot. So the girls are up and they're safe and they're warm and they're comfy and they can come out at a relatively young age with me. And then the middle picture is quite a few years ago, and that's uh, we're out attempting to check fences in the springtime to make sure that they would be ready for the cows to go out. And as you can see, they're still in their pajamas and we're having a picnic. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other picture is of Bridget. I think that's just last year. And that's actually sadly with the sheep in the background. But anyways, and that's a future farmer. And so we're really hoping that all four girls have an interest in the farm, um, that they appreciate and enjoy being raised on a farm. I do make Adam go camping in the summer to try and get away from the farm to have some family yeah. time. Much only once. Only yeah. once in the summer. For like three or four days. Yep, yep. And um, so that's really nice. And then we also do attend some conferences and workshops throughout the year uh, to get off the farm. Uh, so jumping back into just interesting things that we've been doing the last couple of years is um, this is our first attempt at a remote watering system. Um, very positive. So in the background there, um, you can see a solar panel mounted on a post and a battery box with the charge control and everything. And beyond that is where the um, is where the pond is. And so this particular fellow that we rent the farm off of doesn't want the cattle going into three of his ponds. So he said, "That's great, awesome. We're we're right there with you. We don't want that either." So then uh, we set this system up. So it's a Kelm solar system that we bought locally. Um, very simple. I quite like it. You can see in the one picture there, um, the red ring and the white, that's just a, a simple bilge pump that if it breaks, we can replace for like $30. And then the blue part is a float. And then it just hooks into, uh, I believe that's an inch and a half cam lock so. line. Um, it's not two inches, I don't think. And then uh, that just runs, that cord runs into the battery box. And then there's just a just a, a float switch that tells the trough that it's out of water and then uh, everything just comes on and there's a, a solar panel and a charge controller and it was very simple and easy to set up maybe a bit of an investment probably fourteen or fifteen hundred dollars in that setup but it's the right thing to do and um, it's making sure that these cows get really nice clean fresh water too um, because they're not in mudding in the hole um, so there's an environmental component to this and there's a component that makes business sense because we're getting on with the folks that we rent these farms from. Yeah. Um, and then Marie likes working with our Gallagher Smart Fix. Yes, I I really am not a big fan of electric fence. I tend to get shocked all the time and it drives me nuts. Uh, but the Gallagher Smart Fix tester is fantastic uh, because it tells you, it can it will point which way there's a fault. And then every time I'm checking ranches in the summertime, I make sure I check the voltage on the fence to make sure there's no issue because all of our ranches, um, the main um, prohibitor to for the cows escaping is the electric fence. Yeah, it's the only way that we could economically pencil building fence um, is yes. with these exceptionally cheap T posts and uh, two two strand of high tensile electric wire. Most of the time, these fences are only putting out a 3.3. Um, on the fencer. Yeah. That's a rare number to see. <laughs> yeah. um, so all of our cows are, are electric fence trained and we're able to build these cheap fences on these rented ranches. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, this is all me as well. So I, as I said earlier, I attend three farmers markets, one year round, the other two just during the summer, um, where I retail lamb, pork, beef, goat and rabbit. Um, we do do some farm gate sales and we do do some whole tasks and cuts. Most of our marketing is just of cuts. Uh, it's going relatively well. The feedback is quite positive. There's always, um, I always find it interesting talking to the consumer because they have lots of questions about things that they've read online. Um, and most of them are remarkably interested in our story and just want to know who they're actually buying the product from. Yeah, so it's quite positive. So we're also not making any niche claims uh, in yeah. terms of this, in terms of the beef or or any of the other meats that we raise. Um, but we find that generally people just want to know who we are and what we're doing. And um, we quite often tell people that uh, we 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 feed our our young family with the with the meat that we produce, 
and um, and so it's it's very healthy and very tasty. So it it markets itself uh, when you talk about it that way. Uh, so a big part of being able to sell my meat at the farmers market is working with the local abattoirs, and we're quite lucky that we have we used to have three, but uh, once just stopped killing, so we have two. Uh, butcher shops very close. So Windcrest Beef Packers is the one that I utilize for all of my lamb and some beef and he, they are 30 minutes. They're just located in Port Perry and then Hilt Butcher Shops in Norwood and that's where we just recently started sending our beef and my mom sends her pork and they're a bit further. They're 40 minutes away. Um, both meat, both butchers are fantastic to work with. Um, I can email them. I can call them. They're very knowledgeable on their cuts, and I've never had an issue, um, thankfully, with them. They are very prompt, and they can fit me in sometimes when I haven't um, been as well organized as I should uh, for getting custom cuts out and stuff like that. Um, so all of my meat comes back with a label on it, because to be able to sell it at the farmer's markets, it needs to have the butcher logo on it, and then it needs to have the date that it was packaged on it. Uh, we also get them to weigh it, and when pressed, prices my lamb cuts for me. So it doesn't price my uh, beef for me because I haven't sent them down my price list yet, but they would also do that. So that's a nice time saver because I'm not sitting there with customers in front of me trying to figure out how much their steak is. Mm -hmm. Bridget absolutely hates going into the butcher shops. I don't think she likes the smell of it. She'll, she's more than happy to unload the animals, but she won't go into the actual butcher shops. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So um, another piece that we're really excited about because they do phenomenal work up there mm -hmm. is, um, I suppose, in the Woodville area, let's say. Um, so probably 40 minutes north of us um, is the Victoria County Community Pasture. And I should have asked uh, someone how many head. They're well up over a thousand head on this pasture that, and they run several very large groups. Mm -hmm. um, 95% of the animals or 90% of the animals are all steers and heifers that are being backgrounded. Um, but they run about 80 breeding heifers in a group with two bulls. And so we've been sending our heifers to get up, to go up there to get bred for three or four years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's a great program. They look after the cattle exceptionally well. Yeah. They do rotational grazing. Um, full health salt mineral program like they're exceptionally well looked after mm -hmm. um, and I just thought I I wanted to put a plug in for them that um, it's it's a it's a great piece for us um, because then we don't have to worry about which bull we're going to pair for these replacement heifers like a, you know like a heifer bull or have to AI these heifers we just send them up there and they do their thing and then they come home and um, very reasonable costs. Like I think it's somewhere between 155 or 175 dollars per heifer. Don't okay. quote me on that, please. But that's roughly it's it's great value for us. Mm -hmm. um, and I threw up the average gain this year. I thought was very good. And they also preg check them before they come home, so we know um, before we even check preg check the main herd what we've got out of our replacement group. Now it's very very tough to get into this group. Um, we were fortunate enough because they give preference to people that live in the former Victoria County or their operations. So we're in the Corth Lakes region. Um, if we wanted to send them up more heifers than those seven or eight, I don't think we would be able to. Um, well, that's I, why we've got some of the background program. Yeah, so we've moved some into the background program and we've been bringing them off in October and then breeding them then as well with our own bulls. Um, so now we're starting to develop a bit of a summer calving, fall calving group as well. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been a great little piece that we've uh, been a part of, mm -hmm. and speak very highly of the people that do all that work up there. Yeah. So we've uh, we've been doing lots of learning, and it's kind of a, an ongoing, lifelong thing, I suppose, for us that. Uh, as we can, we're fortunate enough to be able to go to all these programs. Um, so I attended the BFO AGM last year for the first time as a as a voting delegate, and Marie, you went up as a youth delegate. Yeah. And so that was really neat. It was just a nice introduction to it. Yeah. No, great networking opportunity. Definitely. Um, we were fortunate enough to host one of those Zomafra BFO grazing cover crop days. That's that one is happening down in Lambton on Saturday of this week. 
highly recommend people attend that. They're great days. Um, Hands-on learning is fantastic. Marie in, completed our environmental farm plan and grow your farm profits workshop. Which I actually in chapter eight, our environment yes. farm plan because it needs so, to be upgraded every few years and I haven't done that. Yep. Um, Marie also participated in the build leadership program. Which is absolutely fantastic. You are talking about networking earlier and that, yep. yeah, it was yep. very fantastic. It was a great introduction to more beef producers. Yep. So now here we are pumping up the BFO staff uh, tires. Hopefully Beth, uh, we get brownie points for this. Um, and all, I was fortunate enough to also travel to Western Ontario and participate in the Beef Youth Development Program. And that was when I got a tour of Sandra Voss's farm and a couple other folks in Western Ontario that I would have never set foot on their farm or met people. So it was a fantastic um, opportunity. Um, we've also attended Farm Smart um, with the livestock component. Yeah. Um, I went to the Southwest Day Conference every other year for almost 10 years now. I've done the diagnostic, crop diagnostic days. Um, our local soil and crop improvement associations are very active and I go to a lot of their meetings and they're very good. Um, also trade industry grower meetings and local. Uh, I also sit on the Victoria Beef Farmers Board, so I'm starting to meet more of our local producers as well. Um, and so we host some very good producer education meetings from time to time as well. Um, so I thought that Marie and I should maybe list out what we've experienced and what we would recommend. So anything on that list is worth attending if you ever can. Mm -hmm. And so how would you talk about that one? So the networking apps that we like to use, our vet is absolutely fantastic. He's available through email, he's available for phone calls, and obviously he does emergency calls. He also comes out and does our preg checking, and then once a year I make sure that he's out to look at the sheep as well, um, just to do an overall health uh, assessment of the farm. We are very fortunate that we've got quite a few feed suppliers in the area that we work quite closely with. Our bank lender, well, we couldn't farm without her, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> but that's where we are right now. Our accountant also makes sure that we're filling in our books properly. Um, OMAFR staff is a great resource. They're also our uh, neighbors, friends, and peers, definitely. Um, Adam was very fortunate. He did a lot of 4-H throughout the years, mm -hmm. and then we both did junior farmers, which um, we met lots of people with like-minded and in similar situations that we are still in contact with now, even though we've aged out of both of those programs. Um, Adam is very, very active on the Twitterverse. I occasionally <laughs> open up the app, but it's not my favorite one. Um, again, industry salespeople, that's more of an Adam thing, I would say, uh, because he is in the industry and so he's meeting them all the time. And then finally, for uh, the network, the BFO staff, which are also readily available and uh, very helpful. This for apps that we like to use, um, as I said earlier, Adam's very active on Twitter at farming for you um, and he's uh, uh, quite often looking at that for different advice and just uh, catching up with people. The weather network, uh, I check that daily, almost hourly sometimes, <laughs> um, not only for the school bus but also just to see when water's, water might be freezing um, and stuff like that. The next one, that would be Adam. The first you know what that is? No, I don't know what that is, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so if I ever want to know fertilizer removal by, by yield by a particular crop, then you can punch in your expected yields and what your fertilizer removals are. I never do that. Yeah, I never do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I have the New Holland My Shed app on my phone for our New Holland tractor, so we can look up parts and diagrams, and uh, it's exceptionally helpful. We also have a due date calculator that I run sometimes because we'll be like, well, what happens if we put the bowl or the ram in at this day and what's going to happen? Yeah. Um, or if we see somebody being prime, we'll be like, oh, what yeah. should she cast? Yeah, so it's handy. Uh, so we're both on Snapchat. Um, that's mostly just a social thing for us. Marie's on Instagram and on Facebook. So we have Facebook and Instagram pages for the farm yeah. to kind of connect and, and do a reach with our, with our customer base at the markets. Um, this one is not promoted near enough in the industry, and I don't know when it came online, but there's a, an app called the Roundup. Which is a terrible name. It, it Maybe, but it's by Canada Beef, and it's consumer focused, so it talks about cuts, and it has mm -hmm. tons of recipes on it, and um, you can find it in the Google Play Store, or I'm sure it's on um, iTunes too, or whatever you call that, yeah. uh, Apple stuff. Um, but anyways, it's something that we should be promoting in, as, as producers in the industry. And we're promoting it at the, the at the market. Yep. Um, there's also a whole ton of other 
um, physical paper resources if you just ask the beautiful staff yes. um, for pamphlets on anything, any issue in the industry you can think of, they've got likely a piece of paper for it. So that's, we do like circulating those around. We use OneDrive to save all of our files in the cloud. Um, we use a expert for accounting. It's also cloud-based, which is right, nice. Right. Google Photos, which helps us uh, in a number of tasks. And uh, some of the software that we use to keep track of the herd is uh, Kyle Max uh, software. Mm -hmm. But we use it kind of intermittently. Um, so these are some of our goals for the future. Um, so we want to grow the herd numbers. I'm not sure where we want to go. I don't know what to realize Once, that. What, when we get there, we'll know that we're where we want to be, but we're not sure where we're going to go. Um, we sold some bred yearling females as commercial replacements for the first time this year. Um, and that's a segment of the market that we want to get into more. Um, now that we've got the herd to a decent size, we've got some good cow lines that we feel comfortable sharing with the marketplace as good replacements. <clears throat> we want to make our calf crop more uniform. Um, and in line with what we think the buyers are looking for or the majority of buyers are looking for. Mm -hmm. So we would like to phase out the black cows, go to more of a red herd. Not that, as you, if you've seen any of the pictures we've worked with, if there was six or seven main breeds in Ontario, we've worked with them all and are currently working with them all. So yeah. we're, not, we're not blinded to a particular breed at all. Um, but that's just maybe the direction we want to go in. We're going to have to start investing in infrastructure ourselves. We can't right. continue to lean on mom and dad um, on the farm anymore, whether that infrastructure is at our home farm or whether it's at mom and dad's. We haven't talked about it, but we don't have any formal succession plans in place. So um, that's why some of this stuff is is an evolving thing. Mm -hmm. um, we don't really know where the path is going to lead, but we'll get there when we get there. Mm -hmm. um, A way scale would be very beneficial because it's mm -hmm. not, we are, as we are a cow calf operation and it would be nice to get you able to be culling cows based on how much their calves weigh at weaning yeah. because that's mm -hmm. if they're not weaning they have enough calves and they shouldn't be here that's their only job yeah. so one thing that i really want to key in on is knowing and understanding our cost of production because i could no one asked me a question about our cost of production please because i don't know what it what it would be um, we also want to improve rotational grazing in the summer and start residue grazing, specifically corn stalks. Yeah. Um, things to change. Uh, Marie wearing goofy sunglasses. At least like I'm not that. wearing my goofy hat in that picture. <laughs> Marie didn't want to use this picture. I said, no, we have to. Um, but we don't want to haul and, and spread manure uh, as much as we do right now. We want to do more of this grazing cover crops and the cows are spreading manure ourselves. Yeah. Because um, we're putting, we're now clocking hours onto our own tractor, and so we're incurring operational costs and um, equipment costs and fixing costs on this silly tractor that we have now. Um, and so we also want to feed less stored feed, yep. and we want to produce more forages from annual crops and uh, sliding into into the way that uh, the cash crop side of things works. This looks like it was Does we render? Yeah, I think so. There's one more. Oh. Just talking about social media. Interestingly enough, the most snarky tweet I think I've ever tweeted ended up having the most views on a little video that I've ever had. It had like 7,000 views and like 25,000 impressions. But that's a fairly snarky tweet. Um, so You're it's really just like yeah. Social media is an interesting beast, and so, anyways, um, I just thought I'd throw that out there. That uh, I don't know what to think about social media. That's why I wrote on social media. Um, because we're all hiding behind computer screens, not having conversations and things like that. But there is some positive things to come uh, when we're connecting with consumers and things like that. So um, there is good and bad with this social media thing. Um, and here's some final thoughts. We're, we're trying to figure out how we can make this farm economically viable for us, for our generation, as we transition. And also if we have all four kids and their families wanting to come into the farm business, how are we going to prepare ourselves for that? Um, those are some of the thoughts that are going through our heads. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the issues that the BFO staff deal with day to day, um, we thank the staff for their hard work and I'm sure they have very frustrating days um, on our behalf representing us as producers, but these are, these are issues that are impacting our business decisions and our thinking 
and they do weigh heavily on us day to day. So um, I think that those issues would be really reflective of a lot of producers in Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, so then we always wonder whether we're going to continue to kind of farm like we always have or whether things are going to change a little bit. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. So thank, thank you very much. We uh, hope that you've learned something, you have something to take away and maybe you have some questions for us. All right, with that, I uh, invite people to uh, ask any questions that you might have as, uh, as we wrap up here. Um, with that, I'll start out with one that I have for you guys. So you talk about with uh, your renting land um, and a lot of the land that you guys have for pastures is, is rented land. Um, is that just that you find in the area that you're in, it's, it's land prices with that um, you're finding it easier or just lack of land? Or it's just people are more willing to rent to you as opposed to to selling their land. A little bit of all three, I think. Land prices are quite high around here, and a lot of the land is in cash crops, which is prohibitive to um, grazing. And then we've also been very fortunate that we have rented one farm for quite a number of years, and two of her neighbors have then approached us about using their farmland for grazing cattle on as well which has been um, really great that way as well. So I'd say it's a mixture of all three, that land cost is expensive, a lot of it's in cash crops, and that we've been approached by other people to utilize their land for grazing, co or grazing cows specifically because they don't want it into cash crops. Yeah, yeah, With that, and that's the way that we're gaining land under our control for renting purposes is through referrals. We, like if you, if you respect and look after the land owners, and and get along with them and we appreciate them allowing us to to work their farms and things like that then they tend to to recommend us to other people um and so we're just very fortunate that we were working with such a good group of people um mm -hmm. and yeah that that's the struggle though is that we have to we have to figure out how to slide our operation into an area where cash cropping is probably the biggest the biggest thing that's happening Mm -hmm. okay. um, another big question um, that comes up, I know with, uh, and I'm sure you've probably heard a lot too when you're talking about with the uh, um, cover crop grazing and how you're just uh, fencing off with the um, one string of the high tensile wire. Are you ever concerned with just that cows getting out, um, the concern that you might have when you're talking to um, other um, like the crop farmers um, about having those cows on their farm. Um, it just kind of those issues that come up with it on that front. Um, have you ever ran into those troubles with your cows getting out with just that one piece of wire pulling them in um, along those lines? Well, yes, we have. Oh, yes, we did. Because the first couple of years back at Adam's place, it was on a dirt road and not well traveled. Um, we make sure that we put $2 million liability insurance on these farms that we're moving cattle to. Um, and that is an absolute must. I would say you would be silly not to put liability insurance on that for that reason. Um, the cows are electric fence trained. Um, the cows have been behaving themselves better this year without the calves on them. Sometimes the calves would sneak under the fence in places and things like that. So this is much better. Um, most of the time they're just pushing the interior fences like Marie's turbo wire. Yes. That's where they're getting out and over into the main field, which if is I've not left, a big deal. If I if I'm not as prompt moving them this sometimes, especially with the calves there, then they would the calves would have snuck under into the next section. Um, I don't think we've ever actually had them get out of no. the perimeter fencing though, no. thankfully. But we've had uh, well yes we did we had a calf get out on the road. Now oh. we called and said we've got a calf out on the road. So yeah. And it's just yeah. My mother worries about this constantly as cattle out on the roads and with people driving the roads. Yeah, it's a scary proposition. So it does happen, but you just have to do your best um, to try and make sure it doesn't happen. Um, well, that one other thing is what we do is wherever the fields are that we're grazing, um, I just popped into the next door neighbor um, where we are this year and dropped my cart off and said, they're, they, they're not from a farm. They're just, they're just the nearest house to this field. So I said, if the cows are ever out or give you any grief, just give me a call. And they were super about it. Yeah. We haven't heard from them. So everything's been great. But 
I think that's the kind of the the proactive approach that you need to take when we're doing this. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I've had a question. Um, have you guys ever used um, breeder co-ops or anything um, along those lines to help expand your herd? Because that's what one of the things you guys were talking about. Yes. Um, no, we haven't. We've been lucky enough that every time we want to do a term loan or increase our operating line with our lending institution, they've been more than happy to accommodate, probably because of my income <laughs> from my off-farm job. That's probably what makes our business look okay from an investment point of view for the bank to lend us money. Um, we also, I don't know whether we could because we're, we're in the middle of two breeder co-ops as I understand it. Um, there's, isn't there one Beth up around the Simcoe area, let's say, and then there's one maybe like that starts at Hastings and go and goes into L&A and that sort of thing. Yeah. East Central Ontario, we're kind of in the middle of those two. So I don't know whether they would allow us in, but if, if there was enough producers in East Central Ontario, it's something that we should be looking at as as the producer, local producer associations like Victoria Beef, uh, the Beef Farmer, or Peterborough Cattlemen's, uh, a couple of the other ones in East Central. We should be trying to get something like that kickstarted potentially, but no, we haven't accessed anything before. Okay, um, another question. Um, what do you find as young producers is the biggest barrier or challenge in entering and expanding in the beef industry? Um, what are you going to say? You go first. <laughs> I know what my answer is. For me, it's likely time. It's just you're always feeling like you're running out of time. So to be expanding obviously takes more time. Um, and then land base. We've, we're kind of capped at our pastures right now. We can't really accommodate many more cow calf pairs with our bull like our bull would be able to service more cows but the pasture is capped at how many animals it can take on it currently uh so if, yeah likely land base we need to be accessing more pasture now i i i i did mention already that i don't know our cost of production so mm -hmm. therefore i don't know what our gross margins are and things like that but i question as to whether we have enough margins for this to be fully sustainable in the long term. And maybe I shouldn't be saying this in a beef farmer's presentation, but I don't know whether we're doing much better than a living wage. And I think we need to do better uh, profitability wise. So if I was a young producer um, that wasn't able to link in with a, a, like a, a parent's operation like we are, um, that's a really tough sled. Um, if you're looking at that, um, there's a few examples in the province of people that are don't have anyone younger in the succession plan, but they're wanting to pass the business on. Um, that yeah. that you start off as a young producer, mentoring with that person, and maybe eventually succeed. I think that's a great model. We should do that more often. Um, also, uh, I, land ownership is a concern. Um, we don't have to be tied to land ownership. If I, if I, if we were just starting out, I think I would just be trying to figure out where I could rent facilities yeah. to house cattle and then figuring out whether I could start out with some pasture and then linking in with a cash crop neighbor that I could start grazing cover crops to extend my grazing season and make it more profitable. That's where I would start if I was young and didn't have an operation to, to tag along with. But that's yeah, a tough I, I think that's a, a very different new way that a lot of people aren't really considering and aren't thinking about because I think a lot of people that's really stopping them is is land prices and that land based thing and and I, I don't think a lot of people really think about that you don't need to own the land to necessarily start so I think it's good that more and more people are talking about yep. renting isn't necessarily a bad thing that you can just start without necessarily having that land base to first start yep. with. So. Yeah, and, that, and what what drives our profitability on this farm is having more cows and producing more calves. Not owning equipment, not owning land. It's it's the actual thing that you're trying to produce that produces yeah. your margin. And so yeah, yeah, we're trying to to run a really lean operation um, so that we're generating more gross profit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another question here. Um, you mentioned wanting to work towards a more uniform calf crop. Um, yeah. Would you consider marketing calves through a calf club? Absolutely. Yes, I think they do that in Western Canada. 
and, and or their overall herd sizes are much larger so they can offer um, things like that. Yes, um, which there's some calf clubs in Northern Ontario that are fairly successful that some of those calves come down here to Katie, I believe, don't they? Yeah, and Katie has a calf club there too in uh, around here on yeah. Bruce there, yeah. yeah. So that would be really cool, but I, I'm not willing to put in the time and the volunteer and effort to get it started, but I would yeah. like to be a participant, yeah. participant in that, yes. Yeah, and I definitely know that's something Jacqueline and Dan are uh, thinking about pursuing, working on in the future for sure. So um, yeah. maybe they'll uh, come and talk to you for sure. We've, we've, um, been, we've been big supporters of our local vaccinated special stocker sales. Yeah. Um, for sure. Yep. Yep. Um, I think I think that's it for. Oh, hold on. I see one more question here. Okay. Uh, why choose to phase out uh, black cattle and transfer to red? If that's Chad or Todd, if they're on the, that might be one of them asking. <laughs> I tried to I tried to say that we weren't really favoring one or the other. Um, Currently, our red herd's larger, so it just makes more sense to phase out the black. It does, yes. Just yeah. time-wise. And I also think our red genetics, our base cow herd, are, are slightly better than our base cow herd on the black genetics. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, they're both the red and the black are uh, a Sim Angus cross, so a red Sim Angus cross or a so black Sim so Angus cross, so very similar in complement. It's just color uniformity. Um, we don't tend to like silver calves for some reason, Ontario, or else I would be more than happy to breed all those black cow charlets because I'm pretty sure they would do really well in the yard. But and that's what it's the buyers. We're don't. looking at our um, the price that we get for our calves from the sales barn, and yeah. the blacks just aren't bringing us as much money home. Well, although our our black steers did better than our red steers this year, though. Okay. But I think if we bred them charlet, um, they would do even better. But the, I, we have no breed preferences, or we're not. <laughs> we're not suggesting anything. <laughs> I don't want to get caught. <laughs> you don't turn up your nose at the royal like a lot of people I was seeing a couple of weeks oh. ago. Oh no. no. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that kind of. I'm not missing any more questions here. I think that kind of wraps it up on that end but i'd like to thank you guys for sure i think that was a great presentation we definitely got a lot of information from you guys and uh learned a lot about your operation and the decisions you guys make so that's great that's it's exactly what we do these webinars for to kind of give other people a, an idea of what other young producers are trying to do on their operation and uh we appreciate you guys taking the time out and uh making grandma and grandpa look after the the little ones tonight so well, that's, thank, you, uh, thank you very much. We really appreciate uh, you folks thinking of us to give a presentation like this. And I hope everyone that tuned in uh, enjoyed themselves and, and maybe learned something. Like I said, we're not very special, but um, anyways, we like sharing our story. So thank you very well, much. That's perfect. That's what it's all about. And we definitely appreciate it. So thank you guys very much. And uh, we uh, hope everybody watching uh, enjoyed it too. So thanks so much, guys. Thanks, Pat. Thanks. Bye. Bye.